Hi, I'm speaker, comma guest. <laughs> it's good to see your faces. It was very painful not to be able to see your faces last week, considering what went on here. I heard it was really fun. And uh, I spent the whole time just looking at my own face, which is so boring. And all of you were having so much fun over here, grinning, having fun. I'm glad to be here. We're glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Now we know we can answer a question together that if there were to be a hurricane, who would show up? And these are the people that would show up. So welcome. It was a good hurricane. We personally haven't seen rain in seven months. So we're loving the rain and the puddles. And in fact, at least I don't think Liel probably remembers what rain is because she's just not too. And then our youngest has never seen a drop of rain before today. So it's exciting for us. It's part of being a tourist in a rainy place. So we're excited to be here. Um, because we're live streamed, I can't give too many personal details uh, about what's going on in Indiana. You know what I mean by Indiana, right? So things are going really well in Indiana. We live in the capital of Indiana, Indianapolis. And uh, I hope that's the capital, right? I didn't, I didn't even verify. Anyway, things are going really well. Um, we've had an amazing year. Because everyone's kind of been home, we've been really just investing a lot in the, in the local things going on there. We had to have house church for a time. Now over there, church is, again, uh, only for vaccinated and COVID-negative people. Um, and no children between the ages of 3 and 12 are allowed to go to church. So we'll be at home again. So we're going to have house church again. So it's almost like uh, back in the 90s in Siberia, you know, when they were meeting out in the forests. But we're meeting at homes, and God is doing amazing things uh, every day in people's lives. We're sharing the gospel. I think I told you all last time, but... I learned something amazing during the COVID time that has really uh, impacted my life. And that is that if I were to go up to somebody on the street and say to them, listen, you are on your way to hell, but I have good news. God sent his only son to die for you, to provide a way for you to have eternal life with him in heaven. If I were to just walk up to a complete stranger and say that to him, it would definitely not be the weirdest thing he heard that day. And this dawned on me while I was watching the news one day, and I saw an article on the front page of foxnews.com about two police officers in Maine that lost their jobs because they tortured and killed a porcupine while on duty. And I thought, wow, if this is news, and it's not surprising people, then I need to just go out there and start removing all filters and all worries and just straight up sharing the gospel. And if someone asks me what I'm doing, I just tell them what I'm doing, and uh, let the Holy Spirit work and go ahead. And uh, so far, no one has taken any swings. So we've kept all of our appendages. We're all good. And uh, just to encourage all of you as well that the Word of God and the truth that's present in God's Word is still working in people's hearts. People watching the news today, and we said today, I mean, watching the news yesterday, you would have thought that the cyclone of the century was about to hit, and we would all be underwater and it's just like raining, you know? There's no truth in the news, there's no truth out there, and like Pastor was saying, in here you have a refuge from the storm, literally, and spiritually, that you could come here, you can take the only source for actual objective truth, and you can revel in it for, what time do it? Two, two and a half hours of nonstop truth, and that's such a refuge, it's such an encouragement. So today, I wanna share with you uh, something that the Lord has been teaching me so if you'll turn with me to the book of Ezra. So you have a new church member named Ezra, right? He was born a month ago. Who here knows Ezra? All right, most people. Who here is here today? Who's here today? All right, almost everybody. All right. Usually I ask this question to see who's actually there. Let me ask again, who's here today? Who's here? All right, more people. More people are here. All right, a couple more questions. Who has ever gone on a long journey? More than 200 miles, say. No? Okay, most people. Who's ever gone to the pharmacy? All right, definitely. Everybody's gone to the pharmacy. Who's ever sat in traffic on the belt? All right, there we go. We got everybody in that one. <laughs> 
Everybody sat in traffic on the belt. Today, as I was walking from the car, which I parked in Queens, um, I walked past a guy who was walking, it was pouring, just walking down the sidewalk on East 21st, uh, no umbrella, just slowly walking towards me, uh, getting soaked. And I really felt bad for him, and I wanted to give him my umbrella, but I read his shirt. It said, if you annoy me, I will hurt you or something like that. So I was like, <laughs> I'm just going to let him walk by just in case. I don't want to annoy him this morning. <laughs> but I thought to myself, where is this guy going, walking in the rain down East 21st? I mean, there's nothing over there back there besides that funeral home, right? I couldn't, I couldn't think of any place that I could be going. Who here has ever people watched? just sat there kind of watching. Did you ever think to yourself, I wonder where that person's going? I wonder where that person's going. Or maybe you were sitting in the traffic on the belt and you saw some random Illinois license plate, actually where I parked, I parked behind a guy with an Illinois license plate. I think, where, where was that guy going? How did he get here, you know? Everybody's on some kind of a journey, right? Everybody's traveling, everybody has a place that they're headed to, and we hardly ever know, you know, where's that guy going? Where's that person going? And everybody's going somewhere, all of us. We're on a journey, either a long distance in miles, maybe. Some people are here, they've come from far away. Some people have come from short uh, places, but everybody's on some kind of a journey. And so today, this afternoon, I wanna share with you some things from Ezra chapter eight about how to be on a journey led by God. Because we, I mean, my wife and I, uh, we have been on many journeys over the last five years, and it seems like we're maybe not so much during COVID, but we're always living in a suitcase or talking about packing and talking about 50 pounds, right? How to get that luggage under 50 pounds and just always planning a journey and thinking about what we're going to do when we get there and how we're going to get there and if we have enough food to get the babies there and where we can go that has chicken fingers and french fries so the babies can eat, right? You know, you're your restaurant choices just go like this once you have little kids. You go everywhere and now you're just like, boom, where this, where's their french fries, you know? <laughs> Everyone is on a journey. And this is what the people of Israel were in the book of Ezra. I want to share, now that I met Chad, and I know that there's at least one other accountant in here, I feel a little bit more comfortable to say a few numbers. Because I, I know at least he'll remember the numbers, and then everyone else will forget. But to put ourselves in history, if we were to open up the book of Ezra chapter 8, we are around 458 years before the birth of Jesus, right? So let's just say 450 to be round. Um, but I said 458 because I'm an accountant. And I have to say the exact number, but we can just round now. 450. The, the people of Israel had left Persia and made their way towards the land of Israel already more than five decades before that. So actually, the people of Israel had been in the land for about 60 years by the time this chapter was occurring, by the time the events in this chapter occurred. And in that first trip over, which came with uh, a guy called Zerubbabel, who knows who's, who ever heard of the name Zerubbabel? Whoever tried saying that? Yeah, no one else, right? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Anyway, it, it means like the seed of Babylon. So he was, he was born over there. And he brought something around 50,000 people with him from Babylon to Israel all the way back uh, in the f about 500-something years before, 530 years, say, before the birth of Christ. So we're 60 years later from that, but they went for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. Right? They were in Babylon. They were all involved in all the culture going on over there, and they were worshiping God by the rivers of Babylon. We read that in Psalm 137. They didn't have a temple they didn't have the normal worship that they were used to or accustomed to. They weren't worshiping according to the word of God, according to the Torah um, at all. And as it goes, when you spend a lot of time out of that, you probably forget a lot of it. And you see that throughout the book of Ezra, that Ezra spends a lot of his time explaining the law to the people of Israel because many of them had forgotten it. And like we learned today, 613 commandments, some of them are very obscure. It's hard to remember all of those. So uh, if we read in chapters 2 and 3 of Ezra, we see that something like 50,000 people came over and they built the foundation and they were there for about 60 years. And then we come to chapter 8. And in the beginning, I better get here before we... 
uh, before we read it. Ezra chapter. By the way, who knows what Ezra means? Nobody knows what Ezra means. Mr. Dave. Mr. Dave. Nobody here knows what Ezra means. Amos. He's not here. He lives on an island. So Ezra means help. It means help. And God used him to help the people of Israel, right? To get over it. That was I think that God chose these names. And he he, he chose the people to be named exactly how they're they're uh, experiencing and, and living out the will of God would go in their life. So anyway, so in the chapter eight, so we're all there. Now that I'm there, we're all there now. Another wave of people is about ready to go to the land of Israel. So you had one wave back with Zerubbabel, which was about six decades ago, 60 years ago. 50,000 people come. So now they're having a second trip to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem. And uh, people had another 60 years to kind of get used to how things were going in Babylon, right? Maybe the weather's better, better shopping. I don't know. uh, Better amenities, maybe lower taxes. Who knows? But a lot of people just decided by that point that they wanted to stay in Babylon <clears throat> because in this round only about between 4 and 7000 people came compared to the 50000 that went back, went back the first time and in fact there were only 1772 men if you were to read the first 14 verses and count them all someone did that and uh I saw the number I didn't sit there and counting every one of them but about 1700 men came and that was it far fewer And so, Ezra comes, let's begin reading in verse 15. I gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahava, and there abode we in tents three days, and I viewed the people and the priests, and I found there none of the sons of Levi. So, he gets there, and he says, okay, Ezra's coming, he's going to take all these people back to the land of Israel, and he sees the people, and he sees there's no Levites. So this is the first... The first uh, journey led by God. This is our theme for today. A journey led by God starts with spiritual goals. Okay, that's the first point. It starts with spiritual goals. And I'm excited because my inspiration for setting goals is here. My brother Luke, that guy is the best goal setter I've ever met. He could say on August 1st, I will spend only $29.67 from now until August 31st, and he'll do it. He's amazing. He's amazing at setting goals. Every journey led by God starts with spiritual goals. So Ezra comes and he sees the people and he says, wait a second, there's no Levites there. And he understands that they're going back to the temple. The temple was built 60 years ago and there were about 500 Levites that did go back at that point, or 700 Levites that went back there. But what would be the reason for the Levites? If you look in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read a verse, a couple of verses from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 11, it says that, when uh, he's speaking to the Levites, that you may uh, teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 33, beginning in verse 8, And of Levi he said, Let thy thumim and thy umen be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massah, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed my word and kept my covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee, and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. So the people of the the Levites were given the goal, the the task by God of being the teachers of the people. These were the people that were chosen to explain all of these crazy, weird, uh, obscure laws, and also the ones that are less obscure, right? They have all kinds of different laws, more than 600 of them. And Ezra understood that taking the people of Israel back to the temple with no Levites, nobody would know what they were doing. They wouldn't have the proper worship in the temple. So he, in verse 16, he sends for Eliezer, which means my God helps, for Ariel, for Shemayah, and for El Natan, and for all of these guys, men of understanding. And I sent, and I sent them with commandment to Ido, the chief at the, at the, at the place, Kasifia, and I told them what they should say unto Edo and to his brethren, the Nethinims at the place Kasifia, that they should bring unto us ministers for the house of our God. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding, uh, the sons of Mali, the sons of Levi, the sons of Israel, and Sherebiah with the sons of his brethren, 18, and uh, verses 19 and 20 even more. So 
He says, okay, we need, we're going on a, a spiritual journey, a journey that we want to be led by God back to Jerusalem, back to Zion, and we want to reinstitute the temple worship. And what does he notice? No Levites. So he goes out, he gets some men, and they send Levites. So they got three, 38 Levites in the end and 200 temple servants. So now they were able to go to the land of Israel with the people that when they got there, they could explain to everybody what to do in the temple. How do we... Um, do the sacrifices properly? How do we put the temple ornaments together in the correct way and the, the fabrics and all of these things that would be needed? The Levites were going to be the teachers. So Ezra knew that to get thousands of people to go to Jerusalem, especially ones that were so comfortable over in Babylon, it seems, uh, but to get them all the way there, uh, unable to operate the temple would be a complete waste of time. Right? Imagine they had built this temple 60 years prior. Everybody gets over there, and nobody knows what they're doing. They don't know how to operate the temple. They don't know how to do the sacrifices. They're just going there because maybe they want to go to Israel because, I don't know, they want to go back to the land of their relatives. They want to go back and experience the, the place where their families came from. Maybe it was a form of Zionism back in the day before there was a such thing as Zionism. But Ezra understood that any journey needs to have spiritual goals. The reason why they were going to, to the land of Israel, it was for a spiritual reason. And they needed to be ready. They needed to be ready to, to uh, institute that temple worship. And he knew that it would be a waste of time otherwise. And he understood that the spiritual goals that he was setting for them in operating the temple, that these goals would unify them. So maybe we can summarize it this way, that for any journey, any journey led by God, the spiritual goals are always the most important. Now, these people can be going on any journey. And we talked about people we see all over the place. Everybody is going somewhere, right? Everybody is going somewhere. But the question is, is there a spiritual goal for where they're going? Because if there isn't, their journey will not make any sense. They have no meaning in this journey. They're just going about their lives or we're going about our lives with no meaning to it if the spiritual goals are not set at the beginning of the journey. And that's exactly what Ezra did. He said, okay, we're going to go back to the land of Israel, but we're going to make sure we go there with the spiritual goals in mind to reinstitute this temple worship and to make sure that we are worshiping God exactly as he prescribed for us to do back in the law. So, first step, that a journey led by God starts with spiritual goals. Second, beginning in verse 21, a journey that's led by God, it starts with spiritual preparation. You can't go if you're not prepared. So I proclaimed a fast there. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for our, our substance, all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this and he was entreated of us. So a journey led by God, it starts with spiritual preparation. So the first thing that Ezra did, after he got, he made sure that the spiritual goals were set, he got the Levites to join the caravan, and they're like, okay, now we're going to go, but we need to prepare ourselves. So what did they do? They fasted, and they got on their faces before the Lord, and they asked God to protect all of their themselves, their little ones, and all of their substance, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. The journey was going to be very, very perilous. And the way that they were going to make it through that journey was through faith. And the faith begins with an acknowledgement of the fact that they are utterly dependent on God. It, he was probably a high-ranking individual in, in Persia. He had a lot of connections. Uh, he knew Nehemiah, who we'll hear from later, you know, as the book goes on in the next book of the Bible, Nehemiah. But he was so concerned with God being glorified through this journey that he didn't even want to ask for a military escort. He basically said, listen, we told the king that God shows his pleasure with us uh, if we love him and if we serve him. This is the way that he shows that he is pleased. So if we were to then go and ask for protection, then we're basically saying that we don't trust that God will protect us or that we're not right with God such that he wouldn't give us his favor on this journey. He's admitting the fact that they need to be utterly dependent on God. And we see that they trusted God to take care of everything, as we mentioned, and that faith enables them to glorify God even through the journey. The journey itself, and even the preparation of the journey, it's part of glorifying God. Ezra understood that God's will and glorifying God, it isn't when we reach the end. 
right? Or when we fulfill a goal. Glorifying God is both in the is also in the preparation for the journey itself and the journey itself and how they got there. And they understood that if they were to just get this escort from the military and not exercise the faith in God, that wouldn't be glorifying God. Even if they got to the to the end of the journey and they got to the land of Zion safely, he would rather put all of his faith and trust in God than to put any confidence in man. So here's a question. Is that risky? No, it's not risky. It is not ever risky to put all of your faith in God and none of your faith in men. But it's hard. It's so hard to do that because it's easy to ask somebody that with a gun to come with you, right? Just come along with me and we'll see why we'll need a gun in a second. We, we, got, some, we got some dollars to talk about. So Chad, you stay with me for that part. So he understood that he needed to put every single bit of his trust in God and also in the way he led them, right? If he showed any fear, then the people would have been afraid. This was going to be a really scary journey. And so a journey led by God, it starts with the correct spiritual preparation. So they prepare themselves to glorify God in the journey itself by getting on their knees, by fasting and asking the Lord to show them the exact way that they should go. And they fasted and they besought God for this and he heard them. And he uh, was entreated of us, he says. So they started, they set their spiritual goals, right, to get the temple working, to get the worship of God exactly how it needed to be according to the word of God. And then next, they started with their spiritual preparation. They fasted and they got on their faces before God and they said, listen, we need you to take us there. We don't want to ask anybody for help. We don't want to ask the king. We want to show and lift your name up in face of all of these nations to show that we can get there safely. And we'll see that this is a miracle because in verses 24 through 30, we see that a journey led by God continues with spiritual diligence. So we set our spiritual goals, we have our spiritual preparation, and next we have spiritual diligence to get from point A to point B, beginning in verse 24. Then I separated 12 of the chief of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of their brethren with them, and weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I even weighed unto their hands 650 talents of silver, and silver vessels and hundred talents, and of gold and hundred talents, also twenty basins of gold and a thousand drams, and two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord, the vessels are holy also, also and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Watch ye therefore, uh, watch ye and keep them, until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites, and chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So I took the priests and the Levites, the weight of the silver and the golden vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of our God. Okay, so lots of numbers in there. Uh, who has any idea what we're talking about in terms of numbers here? Who knows how much a talent is worth? Yeah, so when I first read this, I was like, yeah, it sounds like a lot of gold and silver and stuff like that. I had no idea what they were getting themselves into. And that made me understand a lot better the whole chapter. So I just did the calculation for the 25 tons of silver uh, and the three and three quarters tons of gold. So just the silver itself and just the gold itself. Who wants to guess how much the 25 tons of silver is worth? Chad, how much do you think 25 tons of silver is worth? Not a clue. All right, I'll help you. 18 point six million dollars eighteen point six million dollars of silver that was and I'm not even talking about the basins of gold and the vessels of fine copper and all of that stuff I just weighed the 650 talents of silver and the hundred talents of gold just that in the beginning there uh, in verse 26 how much do you think the 100 talents of gold is worth if we're at we're eighteen point six million dollars worth of silver how much do you think the gold's worth more or less? More, yeah. $213.9 million worth of gold. On, on yesterday's, uh, I don't know what the gold was trading for back in those days, but based on yesterday's price of gold per ounce and silver per ounce, we're talking about $18.6 million of silver and $213.9 million of gold. And he didn't ask for a military escort. <laughs> They're just walking with only 1,772 men, right? All the rest were women and children, so probably not going to be good 
uh, like defense against the bandits. They did not have weapons, and they're walking through a very perilous part of desert with like 300 plus million dollars worth of precious metals. Crazy, right? Crazy. So you think, who would think that they would want a military escort for that? Yes, everybody, right? <laughs> I definitely would have wanted a military escort. I would never walk through the, the desert with $500 million worth of precious jewels with a bunch of children and no military escort. It's crazy. It's crazy to think. But it would require for them spiritual diligence. Ezra encouraged the people to see it through all the way to the end in verse 30 to bring all of these precious metals to Jerusalem and to the house of their God, to not give up. They wouldn't be able to turn back. Once they started, they needed to get that there. They couldn't go to the temple and have proper temple worship without some of these basins and implements, right? These were holy things that, that were needed by the Lord. He says in verse 28, Ye are holy unto the Lord, the vessels are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord our God of your fathers. These precious metals, these jewels, this millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff was necessary for the goals to be fulfilled. They were necessary for the correct worship of God when they got there. And a journey that is led by God, it needs diligence. In order to get from the preparation phase to seeing the goal come to fruition at the end, there needs to be diligence. In verse 29, he says, Watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests. When they got there, they were going to weigh every single last ounce of all of these things to make sure that everything had made it so that they could rejoice together. So there were 22 men that were specifically chosen in verses 28 through 29 to have this serious and special task that was based both on their holiness and the holiness of the task itself. The journey itself was a holy journey. Many times, it's, it's so easy to get bogged down by the journey and to think, I just need to get there, I just need to get there, I just need to get there. And then we forget about what is going on around us. That God and his will is manifest in the journey itself. And the tasks that we are called to do by God, his will for our life, that is is a holy task and the journey itself is a holy one and so that's what he's saying here it's a holy journey and it's a journey that will be led by god if you are watching and keeping them and protecting them and they trusted each one of these people that they would not uh steal from the from the uh gold and the silver in between then and when they got there so then we come to verse 31 that a journey led by god number four is completed with submission spiritual submission then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy, and of such as lay in wait by the way. And we came to Jerusalem and abode there for three days. Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth the son of Uriah the priest. And with him was Eleazar the son of uh, Phineas, and with them was Josabad the son of Yeshua, and Noadiah the son of Binui Levites. By number and by weight of every one, and all the weight was written at this time. Also the children of those that had been carried away, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the Lord, unto the God of Israel, twelve bullocks for all Israel, ninety and six rams, seventy and seven lambs, twelve he goats for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants, and to the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. So, they get there. They left on the 12th day of the first month. So, this is a familiar time, right? The 14th day of the first month is Passover. So, just about the time of Passover, they leave. They leave where they were, where they had been fasting. They got all the, the measurements made, and they decided that they were going to leave at that time. And they left to go to Jerusalem. And he says in no uncertain terms that the hand of the Lord was upon them. They understood that the journey, that it was blessed by God because he got them there safely. They were delivered from their enemies and from them that lay in wait on the wayside. Those people that were waiting to cash in on their $300 million worth of precious metals, they weren't touched. They didn't show up at all. They made it all the way, all of those many miles, hundreds of miles, uh, safely. And they came to Jerusalem and they waited there for three days. 
and as they were waiting, even before they counted, there would have been more time for people if they wanted to take some of the stuff and run, take some of the money and run, but they didn't. They counted everything on the fourth day that they were there, and everything was there by number and by weight. Everything was written down, and they had it all. So they had made it. They reached the, the culmination of their journey, and they had got there to Jerusalem. And then they did something really interesting. So usually, at least for me, I would think, okay, I just made it through a couple of weeks in the desert with $500 million, and I got there, and nothing bad happened. Wow, God blessed my journey. I'm going to throw a party, right? I'm going to have a party. I'm going to invite all my friends. I'm going to schedule some revival meetings because God is working here. And we got to just, we got to celebrate because look, God is using us to do amazing things. Look at that. We made it all this way. Look what we did. No, everyone was afraid of us, right? Get like excited about the fact that we had made it all this far, all this way with all this money and we had made it safely. and We finally got there. But what do they do? They offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. So what are burnt offerings? I want to, if you will go back with me to Leviticus chapter 4. I know, uh, I'm pretty sure we talked a little bit about, about burnt offerings uh, during the Torah time uh, in recent history, but it's really interesting to me about burnt offerings because burnt offerings, they include uh, a sin offering portion. So in verse 1 and 2, the Lord spake unto Moses in Leviticus 4, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them. Okay, so now we're talking about offerings for unintentional sin. People that are sinning against the Lord and not knowing that they, that they did something wrong. So you're talking about uh, the children of Israel, so the whole people. In verse 3, if the priest that is anointed do sin... So it, it's also aimed towards the priests. In verse 13, if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly. Verse 22, when a ruler has sinned and done somewhat, uh, and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments. Uh, and then in verse 27, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance. So this offering was meant to cover unintentional sin for a person, so that's pretty much everyone, right? Specifically, a priest, so the people that were to be the leaders of the, of the nation, the spiritual leaders, the pastors, so to speak, of the people, the whole assembly, the leaders, and the common people. So every single element of society was covered by this particular offering. It was a sin offering, a, an offering of confession to God, for sins that were unintentional, maybe in thoughts, maybe things that were done in secret and nobody knew about them. Um, they got there after all of this stuff and essentially said, we are sinners. It's very anticlimactic because you would think that somebody that had just done something so great for God and delivered all of this precious stuff that far would assume, wow, God must be happy with me. I mean, I must not be such a bad sinner if God allowed me to make it all this way and accomplish all these amazing things. I don't need a burnt offering. I've got some capital with God that I can kind of rely on that. He's used me so well and so effectively in the last few uh, months. But Ezra does something amazing, which was that every journey led by God, it ends with submission at the end. They got there, and the first thing they did was to admit that they were sinners. Say, look, we know that we had gotten here. We know that God used us. Maybe some of them were surprised. Like, how did we manage to do that? But maybe along the way, some of them had sinned. There were sins of, in their heart or sins in their thoughts. And Ezra knew that. And so instead of praising themselves and being proud about their accomplishments, they admitted their dependence on God by asking for his forgiveness. It's an amazing thing to think about. And so they offer these burnt offerings. And uh, all the people around that saw them at the end of verse 36, they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river, and they furthered the people and the house of God. They furthered the people. It means that 
other people saw that and saw their example and followed God because of it. So four things, four simple things about a spiritual journey. That a journey led by God, it starts with spiritual goals. It starts with spiritual preparation. It continues with spiritual diligence. And it ends with spiritual submission to God and confession to him of sin. So as, as I was studying this passage uh, over the last you know, while, and we, we studied it for our, our young adults Bible study, we're going through uh, Ezra and Nehemiah together, I realized that I don't approach my journeys this way. A lot of times I'll do, I'll do a few things. Maybe I'll start the journey with no real goals. This one's probably rare, for me at least. I know some people are very spontaneous. I'm not an extremely spontaneous person. I like to set boundaries to be spontaneous within. So I don't know if that's defeating the meaning of the word spontaneous or not, but I feel spontaneous within those boundaries. So I'm sure most people would start with goals. I wanna go from my house today to the pharmacy. I wanna buy toothpaste, shampoo, inevitably, chewing gum and candy that they put next to the register just to get me, and then I'm going to go home, right? Those are the goals, to get there, get the things on the list and a couple other things unplanned, and to get back. So most people would start with goals, but how often do I start a journey with no spiritual goals in mind? Maybe I have some, but it's rare that I'll sit down before a journey and be like, okay, I am going to make this journey count in a spiritual way. I'm going to share my faith with at least one person here today. Like I had an opportunity that I let pass yesterday, which I was very upset about, but people are wearing masks a lot, and some people have words on their mask. And this woman was wearing a mask that said, be kind. I thought this is an excellent way to start a conversation. Someone else is wearing a mask that says, be kind. I should ask her what that means to her. It, it was a not the best moment to do it and I wish I would have gone back and talked to her but something like that to go to the store and just say okay Lord I want to share the gospel with at least one person at this store not just buy the toothpaste and get out but but leave someone with a little bit of my faith because of it some kind of a spiritual goal in even the most mundane of all tasks now this particular task was not mundane at all it was a calling of God a specific calling to go from Persia all the way to uh, the land of Israel to reinstitute temple worship so it's not the same as going to the pharmacy, but all of us have a calling of God in our lives. All of us have something that we're called to do every single day that we wake up. Every single day. And that is to glorify God in everything that we do. And I want to encourage all of us today with that first one, that a journey that's led by God, going from point A to point B, led of the Lord, it starts and it should start always with spiritual goals. Planning to make it count for Christ in whatever we do. And then second, a journey led by God starts with spiritual preparation. I think this one is where, at least I, for the most of the time, begin my, my failings in this process. I'll set my goals, and maybe some of them are spiritual goals, but I won't invest the time in the spiritual preparation before I start. I'll sort of just go. And I won't spend the time in prayer. I won't be on my knees. I won't be fasting and saying to the Lord, look, I am going to put all of my trust in you for this journey. I'm not going to ask for a military escort, even if I'm carrying $500 million of cash. Now, on airplanes, you're limited to 10000 So even if I'm traveling with $10,000 in cash, I'm not going to request a, spiritual, uh, a, a uh, military escort because I'm going to be on my face and I'm going to trust in you for everything. This idea of complete trust, it's difficult for us as people because help is everywhere, right? You want help with uh, your um, struggles, you can call this number. If you want help with getting directions to this, you can call this number. The, we went to a store yesterday, there was a mechanical duck giving help on swimming safety for children. I mean, help is just so readily available in our society and in our culture. And often we think, and it's, it's true, it's just easy to get help from a person and get help from this person and, and do that, which is okay. It's okay to get help from people, but our confidence and our trust should always be in God. And this is what Ezra is teaching us here, that a spiritual journey, it is one that is led by spiritual preparation. To take the time in the beginning to admit 
God, I can't go on this journey without you. I need you for every step of this journey. I need your help along the way. And to the extent that someone helps me, it's because you have provided them, and I'm not going to put my confidence in man. And that has encouraged me very, very greatly over the last few months to just rely on him completely through the, I mean, we could sit and talk for hours about the stories of literally having no idea. I mean, we flew in on August 5th. We didn't know we were flying in until August 2nd. There were just so many things that the Lord did to make the trip possible that we never would have been able to trust in a person to do it. And he just said, you know what? I'm going to show that. This whole process of us being in Indiana, in Indianapolis, this whole process of dealing with the government of Indiana, all of these years, God has gone before every single time. I mean, we had to get permission to get back into Indiana for artists. And it usually takes about a month. But we knew someone who knew someone who knew the manager of the department that gives these approvals to get back into Indiana. And they usually take about a month to get the approval. She gave it to us in 30 minutes. 30 minutes. <laughs> and I even said to her, I said, why are you helping us? I don't know. She didn't even know. It was one of those things where it was obvious that God was working. And it's funny because I actually ran into this very woman in an elevator in a hospital a few months ago randomly. And it's just God has a way of going before us, doesn't he? Kind of like you get to a place and you're like, oh, yeah, God was here. That was one of those experiences. Like God, God had been here before. He obviously talked to this woman. And I just kind of showed up after he had already, you know, he was obviously still there, but go with me with the analogy, after he'd already left. And he had already worked in her heart and said, why are you helping me? Why not? That's literally what she said. Why not? You know, uh, whatever. And it was just one of those things where it would be impossible to put my trust in man because it was so clearly God. And it's these things that a spiritual journey, the spiritual preparation, it's so much more rewarding to invest and to put our confidence in God and not our trust in man. And the third thing, that the journey led by God continues with spiritual diligence. Often we set the goals, maybe we ask the Lord for help, and we put our trust in Him to begin. But then as we go, maintaining that same level of spiritual diligence and that trust in God along the way, it's very difficult to every day to renew that trust, to renew that faith, to be constantly on our knees and constantly, as it says in verse uh, 29, watch ye and keep them, to stay awake spiritually on the journey to stay uh, vigilant for the possible enemies, for the possible uh, people lying in wait trying to steal the $500, millions of do uh, 500 million dollars we're traveling with. Ezra encourages these people to stay awake and to pay attention. And this spiritual diligence, it's something that makes a journey led by God continue in the right way, to be diligent and to be trusting him every single day. And then last, a journey led by God, it ends with submission. It's easy to see the Lord do something great and feel good about ourselves or to see God accomplish something. Maybe we, we are able to succeed in getting a track to someone who's been uh, yelling at us. Maybe we're able to finally convince our brother you know, to listen to us for once and stop arguing, right? And we feel like, all right, I must have done something to, to convince him finally to hear me. Uh, and... Uh, it's not that way. God is the one who's doing all the work. And when we see him do something amazing and miraculous, our first response should be to confess our sin. He's like, Lord, I know that even though you have chosen for some reason to use me, I still understand that I'm a sinner and that I need to uh, have your forgiveness every day. In a successful journey, a journey that's going to be led by God in a spiritual journey, there must be a continual dealing with sin to always be in a right relationship with God. I once heard a pastor say to the audience when I was in college, a chapel speaker, he said, are each of you closer to God today than you've ever been in your entire life? And if the answer is no, then there's something to fix. Every single day, we should be closer to God than we were at any other point in our life. And that involves constantly dealing with sin, removing all of those things that are in between me and my Savior. And in that way, we'll be a testimony to the world. As we said at the end of verse 36, 
that the people saw it and they furthered the nation of Israel because people saw, wow, these people trust their God. We want to follow him too. And so a journey led by God ends with submission. I want to encourage all of you today. Our time is coming to an end. All of us are on a journey of some kind. Let's all help each other to set spiritual goals, to prepare, to be on our knees, and to be diligent before God every day so that we can see amazing things happen in Sheeps at Bay, Brooklyn, in the Brighton Jubilee, with our family members, with every, the, our journey, both in the preparation, in the ending, but also in the journey itself, that God will be glorified. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for leading us. Thank you that we can confidently say as believers, for those of us who are believers, that all the way my Savior leads me, that in every step of the way, as we're on a journey that's led by you, we're trusting in you. Help us to put our trust in you, to know and to truly have faith that you can do amazing things and help us to see you work every single day. Please, Lord, use this church. Be with the upcoming weeks and months, the revival, the September 11th, all the things that you're doing, that the gospel would go forth, that people would be changed, and that more and more people would be added to your kingdom and to your people because of the testimony of this group of believers. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.